Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Korra fan commentary track video. This one is going to be for Book 3, Change, Episode 6, Old Wounds. If you have other episodes you'd like to see me do in one of these commentary tracks for Avatar or Korra, definitely let me know in the comment section below. But to sync up your copy of the episode with this commentary track, whether that be DVD, Blu-ray, or online stream, streaming service, have the episode ready to go at the start, including the introduction of the episode. And then I will finish up this intro section to the video. There'll be about a 10 second pause with no audio, just pure silence. And then when I start speaking again after that pause, that's when I'm going to hit play, that's when you should hit play, and we should be synced up after that point. So, bringing the introduction of the video to an end, after the 10 second pause, when you hear me speak again, press play and we should be synced up. Okay, so here we are with K306 Old Wounds. I rate this as uh, my 14th favorite episode of Korra, so pretty high up, right towards the top of the B tier. And uh, this is definitely some of the stuff from book 3 that I like the most. Um, this arc here in Zofu with Lin, this is the focus episode where we find out the issue between Lin and Su Yin, and it obviously relates to Toph in the past. It's really good backstory, it's great development for Lin, it's a good, better insight into Su Yin. And then on the other side of the story, like, it's actually a very solid episode for Opal and Bo Lin, with um, the setup for, I suppose, Bo Lin's arc of, like, he's le he's gonna learn something new. Is it metal bending or is it something else? And, and I, I love where that arc eventually goes. And then with Opal, it's this idea of, like, um... She's worried about disappointing her mom by like revealing that she wants to go to the air temples to train, whereas Suyin wants to Suyin wants to keep her there to train. But yeah, this is a good setup for like Cora. Why don't you learn metal bending? And Suyin's just kind of like Lin's a metal bender. Why didn't she ever attempt even? Now we find out that Korra is of course like the first metal bending avatar, so um, it's maybe not as big of a surprise as you think, but just the fact that she's never even like tried. She just sort of assumed that she couldn't. And yeah, Korra, Korra with Lin as a teacher, maybe not the best idea. And yeah, like we know how much of a sort of fanboy Bo Lin is about Toph and I suppose the idea of metal bending. Oh, and Opal's just kind of like, you're interested, why not? And if Su Yin, such a powerful metal bender, is, is offering this opportunity, why not? Like, what an opportunity to learn from one of Toph's daughters. To potentially get this technique, that would be so cool for you to have. So yeah, Varric's here, of course. And he's meant, basically meant to represent the idea of, like, the theme with Su Yin and Lin in this episode is kind of taking responsibility for your actions. And with Su, she takes the approach of being very willing to give people a second chance. She was given a second chance and she thrived, so she gives other people that second chance, including Varric. And um, so Varric, you see, thriving in Zaofu, and it kind of sets up, you know, where things are going to go. But yeah, here's Ai Wei. Who <clears throat> is a pretty interesting character, and of course that he's he's revealed later to be Red Lotus, and they, they link that in with the very ending of this episode as well. Um, but he actually truly helps Lin here in this episode. So he you definitely get the sense that like this isn't just this complete fake life that he has here. Like to some degree he is invested in what's going on here. And I just feel like if if it feels like there's something missing here. Like they try to emphasize, like, Su Yin and Ai Wei, like, there's, there's an important connection here. And it, I suppose it's mainly just, like, for Su Yin that she was betrayed by anyone within her her own um, place. Um, more so than Ai Wei specifically. But, you know, still, you wish they could do something a little bit more. I always like to see the spirits. And it's interesting that they're hanging out in sort of a kind of spirits-taken-over place. But, yeah. 
part of the plan is to take out the president and you find that out here and that's what sort of confirms to you with everything else that they're doing that their plan is like they obviously had planned at some point to take out like all the world leaders at some point and um, I think the plot in this episode is a little unneeded for the Red Lotus it's one of those ones that once again it highlights their skills and abilities and it uses them in action quite heavily and it's cool but what we want from the Red Lotus is the character stuff and so focusing on their escape from Republic City and really getting in depth on where they are feels a little unnecessary given that like you had sort of Zaheer suddenly show up at an air temple previously yet it's a big deal how they get out of the city it just feels a little bit like unneeded as a plot point like that time could have been better used i think but yeah this is very cool i think the best episode to compare this to is um the earth king with the idea of for a bender where and, and just people in the avatar world where chi is actually this real thing that has this use in techniques that a disturbance in your chi can actually affect you physically in terms of making you ill and this is what happened to zuko going so much against his personality with his decisions that he basically made himself ill and the idea here of her like laying her issues with suddenly bringing up the past again meeting Su Yin again having all these memories that need to come back to the surface it's disturbed her chakra it's made it's put her out of balance and she needs to go to an acupuncturist to um you know get that sorted out cool more technical details but yeah, we find out that all these years ago, I think it's 30 years ago, um, Su Yin hanging out with the Terra Triad, so an earthbending triad. Lane, of course, at this point is part of the police force. So a, a complete contrast of like one taking freedom kind of way too far and just you know becoming a complete, you know, wild child. The other overly like serious, like, you know, to the point where like Su Yin says that you don't even have a life. Like a complete contrast with the two girls there in the past. And you see that like in the present as well. They're, they're, the two sisters are both very, very different. As evidenced by the idea of like, oh, I, I don't know if I'd like Lin as a teacher, but um, Su Yin was a good teacher. And of course, meteorites are perfect for beginner metal benders. With the idea, I suppose, being that they, ha it, they have more sort of rock impurities and just in general, there's sort of a connection that they try to make to the idea of the, the ability with uh, meteorites. And Bolin is invested. He would like to know if he can or cannot actually be a metal bender. But he's disappoint He's um, worried about starting in case he can't do it. That if he doesn't do it, there's still that like hope of like, mm, maybe if I try, I could do it someday. But... If he doesn't fail, that's more disappointing than, you know, if he even started to try. So that's the sort of, I suppose, basic knowledge that most people in the world have is that, um, oh, it's one in a hundred. That, like, that's how rare it is for someone to be able to do earthbending. And, but Su Yin's approach is more that, uh, no, as, as an expert metal bender, my, my impression is more of the idea that I think anyone who tries hard enough can actually do it. Which I think makes sense. Like, I don't think there is this kind of, I think, skill or talent limit on metal bending. I think it is more about, like, if you really put the, the time in and focus and really devote yourself to connecting with earth and metal, I think even, you know, a pretty average bender could do it. And it's, it's more about less their athletic talent and the ability to learn a martial art and more about just pure connection with the element. But, you know, that's just a sort of theory I kind of have. But yeah, this is a cool sequence of just seeing a kind of y younger Lin kind of out on the beat, I suppose. And of course, the setup of this story is that it's so obvious, even from the start, that who's in that, uh, you know, Sadomobile ahead of them, it has to be Su Yin. But again, it's a cool sequence to see sort of like a slightly like older version of this. Like just that the Sadomobiles are more like kind of Ford Model T's back here. Whereas they're more like, you know, I suppose 20s cars as we see it in like modern Cora time period. So that's a nice kind of use of just the, the growth of technology of what Sadomobiles were back then. 
or cars, I suppose, back then versus now. And yeah, here, here's a very sort of the guru type thing of just like, if you leave now in the middle of the process, you'll lock the chakra. And I suppose that's the idea here as well of like, leaving without addressing the issues is going to cause even more problems because you're so out of whack. And so her, her seeing Korra as young Suyin. And so she's kind of like, oh, whoa, I just had this hallucination. I can barely walk, uh, I, I have to go back. And I, I, I just love it when they can show that idea of like, yes, there's chi blocking, that's a very physical version of like, okay, you know, when you get punched in the arm, like you can affect your, your chi flow and your bending on that arm, but here's a more sort of mental kind of version of that. And and what's interesting here is that, you know, I suppose the idea is that Suyin's not too in deep into the triad yet, but Lin is making a huge deal about this to kind of prove a point of like, like she's being led away with everything, whereas Lin feels she has to be so serious and kind of, you know, straight and narrow that she's making a point here. But this is where the scar comes from, and it's... You know, it's ultimately an, an accident, but it's an accident that comes from the complete contrast of their both, um, their paths, basically, of Su Yin kind of loving, you know, kind of being free, being part of the triads and this sort of stuff, versus um, Lin just being a police officer and, you know, trying to arrest her, and this is what leads to it. But yeah, like like there's there's a nice tension to this in terms of the action and so on, and of course they always use their abilities very well. But uh, as a side plot in this episode, like was this required? Would it really be much of a problem if after the previous episode they just cut to the group is outside the city, and you can instead of focusing on the action here when you don't need to, because they're going to have so many action scenes later on actually just okay we're out here let's just have more dialogue scenes rather than more action focus like we know we know police can combustion men we know gazan can lava bend let them talk a little bit more like that, that i think there was a better use of time in a lot of these red lotus sequences here because again like it takes until episode nine in this book for them to finally really talk about what is this group who are they what are they about <laughs> Volin just i uh, sneakily have a go at this meteorite. And he's struggling. And it's an interesting because of course he's it's revealed that he's a lava bender, so it's revealed that he can actually do an even more specialized and rare and unique form of bending. So the question that I think we still have is if you have lava bending, are you sort of locked out of metal bending? Or is it just the case of Bolin not being someone who is kind of specifically attuned to metal bending would require so much effort to learn metal bending? Um, it's, it's an interesting one. Like someday could Bolin learn metal bending or can he only do one or the other? I really like Opal and Bolin's relationship. I like that they always just get to the core of just like, eh, can we both be honest with each other? And then they are actually really, really open with each other. It's just a really nice relationship. It, it feels like a response to how drama focused a lot of book one and two were with the relationships of just here is just a really nice and wholesome relationship that you actually care about. And yeah, they're both just afraid of failing. Uh, Bolin's afraid of failing in terms of the ability, but Opal's afraid of, you know, disappointing her mother. Like, she wants to do this. She wants to make use of the skills that she has and, like, learn about the sort of airbending culture and the technique. And it's just really nice to see how kind of well that relationship is going. That, again, B Bolin's thing of thinking, like, oh, is, is Opal a bit too nice? Is she a little bit too plain? 
given the girl he usually is interested in. But no, it's actually perfect for both of them. And yeah, here is Toph. One of our few appearances of like the ATLA cast sort of in the middle of their lives rather than just as kids or later on. And here we go. This co- this is what causes the issue. And and it makes sense like that Toph she can't have one of her daughters be in prison and still be the chief of police, so she has to rip up this report. But for Lynn, that is like you are letting her away with this. You're sending her away to live with, I suppose, Lao and Poppy, but this is, like, she is allowed to do whatever she wants. And this is the issue of Lynn feels like, if I did that, I'd be, like, crazy punished or something like that. Or it's it, it's more, I think, the idea of uh, Lynn puts so much pressure on herself to never be like that, that she is sort of just so restricted in a way. Yet Sue, like, Sue can just get away with that like nothing. And this is the resentment that's been harbored over the last 30 years that's finally going to come out. That Sue has been able to get past this and doesn't really think about it much. But Lynn, this has been in the background for 30 years and it's caused so much stress. And now it's finally coming out. And yeah, Suyin's just like, yeah, like I said before, let's just get straight into this. And so, oh, fight incoming. Talk, sure. Now, the dialogue is actually quite important. And this is the whole point. You could have taken responsibility, but no. And just the different views on it of like, you went away and that's your view on it from a happier perspective. But no, she was so felt so guilty about that, that she resigned so as to not be in the position in a sort of dishonorable way. And Sue's view on this is just like, yeah, we already talked about it without realizing that the person she needed to talk about it with the most was Lynn. And just it's just that contrast of the person who holds on to it for all those years versus the person who almost lets it go too easily. That like, we've already got past it, like, so it doesn't matter anymore type thing. And then, whoa, big line of dialogue there. But yeah, big fight here. But it it is one of those things where that line, I think it's more than just meant to be sort of a controversial statement of like, in a way, like, the impression that you get is that like Tenzin was the only love interest for Ten, uh, for, for Lin. So was it this, not this thing, not being addressed for 30 years, that kind of in a way caused that, that she stayed away from being in any sort of relationship or anything? because of situations like this that they're kind of just issues in a way with their parents and you know causing this who on likes the uh destructive influence on it there but yeah just really cool you know primarily metal bending fight you see the difference in style as well one more elegant one more sort of uh, forceful style It's a similar dynamic to say like Tonrock and Unalak, but for Earth here. And I love Opal coming in, that like she's only recently learned she's an airbender, but here she is using it. And, and it's nice to see her kind of really stand up in that way, like big statement here. Why is this happening in the first place? And finally, like... Lynn, it, it all comes to a head here. The the chi disturbance finally. And yeah, the idea is that like she's been asleep for like nearly an entire day here. Like Zuko's uh, metamorphosis, uh, sleeping for like an entire day. <laughs> Mako's just gonna do it. Sixteen hours. 
And yeah, this is exactly the sort of Zuko transformation. Like, Zuko wakes up after the metamorphosis and is like oddly, weirdly nice. And it's the same for Lin. I love that callback to, to the connection. The Kale Nutsko, obviously, it's meant to be a kind of a, related to Ryan Konetsko's name. And just seeing a little bit more relaxed, chilled out Lane is actually quite interesting. And so this needed to be addressed from the last episode as well. Lane shouting at her, but some good advice here. That relates into the sort of reflection on the past. But Opal's pretty understanding about it. And I suppose Lin, being so close to Tenzin, would know, kind of in a way, it would have a, some sense of, like, the skills and abilities required of a good airbender, so, like, that is important saying that. Yeah, she has to make the decision for herself, not about, how will my decision affect my mom? Um, so, you know, she gets the advice that she would want from her aunt, basically, so it's, it's, it's a pretty nice scene. And then this is Opal finally not being kind of afraid to reveal that she wants to do something a little bit more kind of out there, kind of unexpected. But as we see here, Sue is actually like, oh, I'm surprised she just had the courage to come out and say it. And yeah, like, like th this feels very much like the whole Katang siblings issue from the start of book uh, two. Of It's these issues that were big at the time to a degree, but over the years they've remained present in the minds of these characters and have grown into something bigger than they kind of need to be. And in reflection, they are just normal issues in a way. And so they can resolve them and get past them without needing to be forever at odds with each other. And after this, the two are more on a, the same side with each other. But you still have the, the sense of um, Lin is still always going to be the one who focuses very heavily on the rules, and Su Yin is more free about that sort of stuff. As evidenced by the fact that Su basically helps Team Avatar kind of go after, you know, Ai Wei the Red Lotus, and um, Lin was more like, mm, how about no, we don't do that, and be more protective. So yeah, this is how Zaheer is going to locate Korra. And obviously, that scene seems kind of weird, like, wait, what did he just do? Is obviously he just communicated with Ai Wei just there, and that's how the, the communication has happened. And it's an interesting one in that it, it, it takes, like, what, three more episodes for that reveal to, like, properly come out? Um... But it's a, it's a pretty interesting one, definitely, for sure. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think, most of what I wanted to say about this episode. Um, it, it's really, really good. Like I said, I think the only slightly weak thing is just that there's a few, there's a few scenes there with the Red Lotus that I don't think almost needed to be there. That either, just flat out, there didn't need to be a Red Lotus plot in this episode, and you could have given more time to... Opal and Bolin, or um, to Lin and Sue, to the backstory. Or, if you had to have those scenes in there, just do something a little bit different. Like like I said, um, I don't think it was required that you specifically told us this is how they get out of the city, as if, like, it's ever been that big of a deal for almost, like, any characters getting in and out of Republic City. It just feels like oddly specific why they're focusing on that now obviously we see it's primarily because they wanted to show us a lot of those action sequences again to show us the sort of terrorist aspects of the group of just being willing to cause so much destruction on their way 
in and out of places. But the rest of the episode, I think, is very strong. Like, good character development for Opal, Bolin, Lin, and Sue. Features some backstory, getting to see some more of Toph. And I know for some people, like, they're obviously going to interpret that of, like, the typical, like, I don't like Korra response of, wow, why are they always showing the ATLA crew in the past as being sort of bad parents? And I think that the view on that is, like, Toph was put into a very bad situation there by her children. And, okay, was that informed by the way she raised them? Yes, to a degree. But the idea is that, like, it'd be sort of boring if it was just perfect, if just every member of the team who had kids and the kids just turned out perfect and there was no issues whatsoever, that's not particularly interesting. And especially in this one, the they 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 begin to address more of the issue between Toph and Lin later on, obviously more like uh, season four. Um, so here it's mainly about Lin and Sue and their is- issues with each other of just the different approaches they had because they had such different personalities and, and you know approach doing things so differently of like one of them was much more serious and stuck to the rules and so uh, almost didn't have enough freedom in a way because she forced herself into that situation to follow in Toph's footsteps and do nothing else and then one went way in the opposite direction and was so free she was part of the criminal underworld with the triads and was going down a very bad path and in a way the the whole point of this is that in the end like Lin stopping Su Yin at the point that she did saved her basically from uh becoming a full-on criminal that as they state like you'd probably be in prison right now if this didn't happen and then what sort of character would sue be if she didn't go to stay with Toph's parents and then go on her sort of journey of discovery where she went like it was part of the circus here and was like with the sandbenders here at some point and then eventually came to form Zhao Fu that all those life experiences because of what happened happened for a reason and you know, that that incident that day, it led to Lin's scars, but it also led to sort of Su Yin, you know, being put on the, the, the right path. Um, it's just unfortunate that she was able to go on that path and develop in the way she needed to, fix things up with her mother and so on along the way. But for Lin, she held on to this for far too long, much longer than she needed to. But I like that sort of depth that um, they finally kind of get into here they bring up a lot of issues that sort of help to explain like ah this is why Lynn is the way she is to a degree and now she's going to be a, a, a lot easier to deal with in a way going forward but um, like I said you know strong strong episode of book three definitely one of my favorites from the book but um, in the comments let me know what your thoughts were on this one but that's been the video thanks for watching and bye